So last week we talked about Christian nationalism and just the, that I, idea and that term, and it's a relatively new term, at least the way it's employed today. And today we're going to talk about the issue of theonomy. This, these are usually two topics that go hand in hand. The idea of theonomy is essentially, uh, you know, theos is God and namos is law. So theonomy means God's law. And it's a term that was coined to describe how God's law ought to be the foundation for the, our laws in our society. You know, so the civic or judicial realm ought to be influenced by the word of God. And that has been an area of controversy and conversation over the last little while, especially since COVID-19. And, and with the, the, the continued degradation of our society. And so there are a number of people, Christians, who are saying, you know, secularism has failed. Uh, there is no such thing as neutrality. Um, and, and the idea of a natural law or a common law that is, that is readily apparent no matter what faith or background you're a part of. And we have a core set of shared values that society can be built upon. People are saying that that is not possible. That is not true. That doesn't work. Now, one thing that I wish to stress as we consider these topics that can be topics of controversy is that one thing that was pounded into my head in seminary or that I, I really took from seminary as so valuable and so vital was, was the line or the slogan or the saying, the proverb that says, before you can say I disagree, you must say I understand. And, and that was pounded into my head. And especially as Christians, this should be our motto and the way that we deal with anything that is controversial. Before you can say I disagree, you have to say I understand. You, you, have, to, you have to be able to frame the argument of your opponent or, or, or the person that you're conversing with and frame it in such a way that you, that you repeat their argument and they say, yes, that's what I believe. And then you can dismantle it. <laughs> Uh, with charity, but you have to be able to state their position where they're like, no, that's not at all what I believe. And, and what's happening in these conversations is that one side says, well, this is what you believe. And the other side is like, no, that's not at all what I believe. And then they say, well, this is what you believe. And it's like, no, that's not what I believe. And, and, and they're talking past each other and they're arguing against things that nobody is actually advocating for. And, and it's really, when I see such language, I, I just feel like, where, where's the maturity? When, when are the adults going to show up to the playground here and, you know, show these kids how to properly communicate? And so as Christians especially, people of integrity, of honesty, uh, people who have the truth, uh, we, we should not be afraid of the most formidable arguments that are brought against the truth of God's word because we have the truth. And so we should be able to, with charity, explain exactly and understand exactly what they're saying and then say, on the authority of God's word, I, I disagree and here's why. And, and it's not just the loudest voice wins, not just the one who has the most followers or the one who has, you know, the, the, the biggest figurehead, but rather it's the word of God and how we reason and explain the word. Okay, so that's just my way of introduction. Now, I, wanna, I want you to think about a few questions here this morning related to this topic because we recognize in our world today that that our society is changing that the ethic is changing that that laws are changing to match this new ethic of our society today um, perhaps some of you when you were younger and you went to share the Christian faith the, the pushback that you received was was more about the believability of the Christian faith well, I just don't believe that God exists or, or I just don't believe that Jesus was divine. I just don't believe that he rose from the dead. I just don't believe in the virgin birth. And so, so Christianity was not necessarily, or the, or the obstacle or the stumbling block of Christianity was more of an intellectual one. But today, the obstacle or the stumbling block for Christianity is more of a moral one. It, it's not just that God doesn't exist or people don't think that or that, that Jesus, I'm not sure if he was divine or not, but rather it is the teachings of Christianity are actually immoral, that they're disgusting, that, that the ethic of scripture takes us back to an, an older age that we know in this modern day and age uh, 
is, is one that is backwards and corrupted. And so there is, there is, a, is a, new, a new kind of apologetic today that must be offered. And so we realize the ethics of our society are changing. The morality of our society is changing. And we live in a day and age where pluralism and secularism are held to be common values that will lead to toleration and freedom and acceptance. And if Christians believe that there is one way to God and that there is one truth, that there is a, a sexual ethic that is binding upon all, just as an example, that then that is seen as intolerant and against freedom and against progress, really against modern values. And so we have to ask, if a pluralistic and secular society is, is regarded today as ultimate, then what is the ultimate standard in a pluralistic society? When you have a pluralistic society where you have many different religions, many different faith groups, many different backgrounds, many different ideas of, about truth, then what is the ultimate standard? What is, what is going to be the standard, the commonality that is going to tie everyone together? Now what we see in our day and age is that human government is going to be that common thread. Just like ancient Rome, you could worship, or Babylon, you can worship any god you wish as long as Nebuchadnezzar is king. As long as you bow to Caesar as Lord, you can have any god. And, and, and that's the way it's increasingly like today. You can have any faith, any religion you want as long as your loyalty is for human government. But what is the standard that human government appeals to? What, what informs today's modern ethic? What, what informs laws? Is, is there any standard or is it, is it simply just man's way or man's intuition? What is that standard? And here are a few questions that I want to get your mind going. What should be the basis for laws that govern our nation or that govern any nation? Is it natural law? That is what would be derived from reason, from logic, from nature itself? Is it man's law? Should it be informed by God's law? His word from Genesis to Revelation? What standards should be used? And consider this question. How do you know what is a sin and what is a crime? You don't want to live in a society where there are thought crimes, where you go to jail for what you think. You don't want to live in a society where, where they imprison people for pride. We know that's a sin, and you can sin in your mind, but we know it's not a crime. But how do we know that? How do we know what sins are sins and what sins are crimes? What is the standard that we, that we use? Also, what is a just punishment for a particular sin or crime. In other countries, and they might even do this today, um, there was a man that was, lived in our community, we lived in Windsor, Ontario, a, a man from India, and he, he walked around and he had no hands. Because the penalty in his country where he grew up was for theft was cutting off your hands. Is, is, that, is that a just punishment? Why or why not, by what standard? Um, should people be sent to jail? For what crimes ought to be sent to jail? Should they be sent to rehabilitation? Should they be forced to make restitution? What about the death penalty? Should we have the death penalty? Why or why not? By what standard? What about murder? What about sorcery? What is the standard for crimes and for punishment? What is justice? And we recognize we, we run into problems here about how do, how do we know what to do? Is it, is it basically just a certain society or community decides this is what they are going to do? Should we have laws in our country against abortion? Should we have laws in our country against homosexuality? Should we have laws in our country against adultery, against bestiality, against pornography? And again, why or why not? Why or why not? Should every form of religion have equal place in a society, come under the equal protection of the law? What about 
religions that teach a false god, should they have freedom to advance the tenets of their religion right alongside the truth of Christianity? What about religions that advocate for child sacrifice? Why or why not? What, what's the standard for freedom, for toleration? Should tech companies like Google or Facebook censor content? Should those tech companies censor content? And I know many of you are probably thinking, no, they shouldn't. They shouldn't censor content at all. But what about child pornography? What about the Islamic rad radicalization of youth? Should they censor that content? And we probably concede, well, well yes, there's, there's probably some content that should be censored. But which is it? Again, it comes to... It comes to by what standard? How do we decide these things? Is limited government good? Is separation of powers good? And why is that? On what basis? By what standard? We are going to have laws in a society, but the question is, what are those laws? What are the basis of those laws? What's the punishment for violating those laws? And how do we answer the question, what is, what is our standard? Now, we live in a society where there is a history, thousands of years of history, that, that we have the law codes that we do. But as we have this thought experiment, you realize that it's actually, it can be a difficult question to think about. A lot of these things we just, we just embrace, and, and we just grow up in it, and we don't really question it. But as we come to a society like we are that is, in many respects, falling apart at the seams, we then have to ask these questions. What is the standard? What is the basis for these things? Is there such a thing as a Christian vision for the government, for laws, for society? It, are, are, are we just those who sit back and say, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong? Or do we have something to say, well, here is what we ought to do. Here is what is good. Here is what is right. And so to go back to this question of theonomy, theonomists say that God's law, his revelation, or his word should be the basis of defining righteousness in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, and in our society. Let me give you a few definitions of theonomy from different sources. Most of these are, are critical sources. That means sources that don't actually agree with the idea of theonomy. Um, and and I'll, I'll just mention this too right off the start. You know, there is so much confusion on this particular subject. So this, this is a label that um, I, I would advise anyone to be cautious of just wearing, wearing a label or not wearing a label because there's so much confusion here. So if you say, hey, I'm a theonomist, like, this, people are not going to know what you mean by that. And, and probably most people think that's a, that's a terrible thing to label yourself. Um, so... Theonomy can be defined this way. This is from the great source of Wikipedia. Um, theonomy is a hypothetical Christian form of government in which society is ruled by divine law. Theonomists hold that divine law, particularly the ju judicial laws of the Old Testament, should be observed by modern societies. Andrew Walker, writing for the Gospel Coalition in an article, article disagreeing with theonomy, he says, theonomy seeks to apply the civil law of the Mosaic Covenant to contemporary civil government. Theonomists wish for civil government not only to take its directions from Christianity, but also to craft specific law in the shadow of Old Testament Israel. Another critical article says this, theonomy in the technical sense teaches that Old Covenant judicial laws are the universal moral standard of civil law for all Gentile nations. Another definition, a more detailed one, by ones who are more sympathetic, say that theonomy holds that God's word is authoritative over all areas of life. That within scripture, we should presume continuity between Old and New Testament principles and regulations until God's revelation tells us otherwise. And that therefore, the Old Testament law offers us a mode for social political reconstruction in our day and that this law is to be enforced by the civil magistrate where and how the stipulations of God so designate. 
And so labels are, are hard to use, as I mentioned, because there is much confusion. Because as I read those definitions, some of them might be scary to some of you. Because the, the, the idea that is in most people's mind is, is what theonomy means or even what Christian nationalism means is, is essentially you take the laws of Moses, you take Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, or even just Deuteronomy itself, and you just take that law code and you just drop it down today. And, and that becomes like, let's, let's rip up the Constitution and make Deuteronomy the Constitution. And that's in a lot of people's minds today. And they're like, well, that, that, was, that is not the intent of the law at all. That, that, is, that is not the intent of Scripture. And, it, and there's a whole host of objections to that. And so some have sought to clarify what they mean by that. And so you might hear some say that they hold to a, a general equity theonomy. A general equity theonomy. And that's because the Westminster Confession of Faith talks about the law of God and says there, he says to them also, speaking about the Jews or Israel, to them also as a body politic, as a society, God gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any, uh, not obliging any other, now further than the gen general equity thereof may require. So what they say is that Israel as a nation and its laws governing that nation are expired with that covenant and with that nation. However, the, the general equity, or what some would say that the principles of those law still are in effect today. And we even see that in the New Testament where Paul talks about, you know, do not muzzle an ox who treads out the, out, out, out the grain. That's an Old Testament law. And he applies that to you, you should pay your pastors. Jesus and, and the New Testament talk about two or three witnesses to establish a charge. That was, that was Old Testament law, Old Testament judicial law, and that was applied in the New Testament. And so what, what these Puritans um, sought to articulate was that while the laws of Israel do not get plunked down today, they've expired with the state of that nation, but rather the general equity or the principles of those law are still relevant and applicable today. And so some like that term, general equity, theonomy, to describe that instead. Now, just, just so you know, these ideas, they, they might appear new today, uh, but these ideas are actually quite old and quite historical. Um, one, one of the, the best examples is one of the, the, one of the kings of England, in fact, the, the only king of England that has been given the nickname Great, Alfred the Great, or King Alfred the Great, and, and he lived in the ninth century. He was an Anglo-Saxon king. And he, he was instrumental in seeing even Viking leaders who were raiding England to see them converted to Christianity. And then he sought to unify all these Anglo-Saxon tribes under the banner of Christ and sought to, to rule in his kingdom in accordance with the word of God. And so he used the Ten Commandments, other parts of Scripture, to make laws in England. And he wrote that Christ had come not to shatter or annul the commandments, but to fulfill them. And he taught mercy and meekness. His laws, like the Old Testament, were based upon restitution. He writes this. He says that through that mercy which Christ taught, that for almost every misdeed at the first offense secular lords might with their permission receive without sin the monetary compensation which they then fixed. Now he wrote this in a day of warring tribes when if somebody did something to one tribe then that tribe would go and revenge and, and avenge you know, that wrong and do something to the other tribe and then you, the cycle of violence continued. And so he goes, that's not the way of Christ. That's not the way of the word. When you read the Old Testament, it talks about making restitution. So if somebody steals something from you, you don't go and kill them or kill their children or something like that, but rather they make restitution. They pay back what they stole, sometimes even with, with extra because of the inconvenience that, that brought. And so Alfred instituted those laws and others like it in that early English kingdom. And of course, there's been others throughout time we... we recognize that especially during the time of the Reformation, uh, you have men like John Knox, Calvin, Bucer, 
Uh, you have men after them like Rutherford, Puritans under Cromwell and others who sought to use the word of God to influence not only the church, matters of personal faith and piety, but also to, to speak into how society ought to be governed. Okay? So that's the, the, the general idea of theonomy is, is using the word of God to influence not just matters of personal holiness, not just the church, but also to influence matters of society and the state, the judiciary. Now, I want to deal with some of the concerns or objections that come to that idea before we dive into some of those scripture passages. The major concerns are as follows. Some say that this causes a confused relationship between the church and state. That if you were to use the word of God to form the basis of laws in a nation, then what you'll end up with is either a church-run state or a state-run church, and you have this confusion, this blurring of church and state that we know ought to be separate. And so we've learned that the church and state ought to be separate, that the church doesn't rule over the state, neither should the state rule over the church. But this this objection is based on, I think, a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding even how Old Testament Israel worked you remember Saul, whenever uh, he was, he'd conquered the city, he'd won that war battle, and then he was supposed to wait for Samuel to come and to sacrifice, but he just sacrificed himself. And then, then Samuel came and said, it was a huge blunder. What are you, the king? You have no jurisdiction to act as the priest and to offer this sacrifice. And so in Old Testament Israel, there were, there were priests and there were prophets and there were kings, and, and, and those roles didn't mix there, there was jurisdictions and boundaries. Now, of course, those roles come together in the supreme ruler, our Lord Jesus Christ. But on under Old Testament administration. And we also know, even the New Testament, that there should be a separation between church and state. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to, and to God's what is God's. We see in Romans 13 that the role given to a civil magistrate, and that is different than the role given to elders of a church. There are separate jurisdictions. And so for those who say, well, there, there needs to be a separation of church and state, we say yes and amen. And where did, you, where did you come to that understanding? And most have come to the understanding that there needs to be a separation of church and state because that's what the Bible teaches, which exactly proves the point. Because the Bible teaches the separation of church and state. So in our society, we should have a separation of church and state. Why? Because the Bible teaches it, which, which, is, which is the point that it's seeking to refute. It actually establishes. Another objection. That if the laws of God are used in the laws of state, then we're going to have salvation by works rather than by faith. It's going going to hold up the law as somehow salvific. This is going to make you a Christian. You're part of a Christian country, and so therefore you are a Christian. And so it's the law that saves. But again, this is a confusion it's not, it's not a true objection. This is not what anyone is actually saying. That law is going to make you a Christian or that law is somehow going to save you. And it, and it wasn't the case even in the Old Testament Israel where the law of God was the law of the land. Paul writes in Galatians 3 that it was never the law's intention to be our savior. The law is the standard, but the law doesn't provide the power to accomplish that which the law demands. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. It it is God himself that justifies through faith. It it is not the law. The law has never been set up as a savior. And so the scriptures never teach that. And so that is not the purpose of Christian law in a society. Another objection is that the fear is that there will be a state religion with forced conversion. A state religion with forced conversion. That this idea that a society ought to be run by by Christian principles or by the law of God, this is is a top-down forcing of Christianity where where it ought to be a bottom-up, a change of the heart. Now again, I don't know a single person who's arguing that we need to force Christianity with a sword or we need a top-down solution to the problems in our nation. And, and, and it's going to come from the law of God. 
Uh, I don't know anyone who's arguing for that. And, and we know that's wrong. And why do we know that's wrong? Because the Bible says that's wrong. Uh, the Bible talks about how conversion is a matter of the heart. That conversion is, is a matter of the proclamation of the gospel. The, the law serves to, to plow, to do that work of preparation, to, to reveal and to expose sin. But, but it cannot convert. It cannot save. And so again, we, we know that it is wrong to force the faith at the point of a sword or any other kinds of punishment. And we know that's wrong because the Bible says it. And so again, the scriptures actually tell us why that would be a bad idea. Again, proving the point, the scriptures give us guidance here. Others argue that this is a confusion of law and gospel. If, if the laws of the land ought to be influenced by the word of God, then it would make a confusion about our task as a church where we're called to go and make disciples and not to advance God's law or social change. And again, I think this is a false dichotomy. I don't know anyone who's saying, let's go make all these changes apart from the gospel, but rather social change and changes of law and of ethics and morality will come through the advancement of the gospel. The question becomes, as we labor to make the gospel known, what do we teach people who believe the gospel to do, to behave, to live? You know, we have, we have teaching from our church on the Christian home. And our teachings on the Christian home can, can be heard by people who are not Christians. Now, as a non-Christian, they won't actually be able to, to live that out faithfully because their hearts have not been molded and shaped that doesn't mean that we ought not to speak about the Christian home to our world today, about the blessedness of fatherhood and motherhood and of children and marriage and what that all looks like. No, this is God's standard for the home. And if you want that and desire that, then you need to be born again. You need to become a Christian. And the same is true for Christian laws or principles in a society. It can actually adorn the gospel. Lastly, another objection is that the idea of God's law in our society is actually a misunderstanding of the discontinuity between old and new covenants. That is, there is, there is a discontinuity between old and new covenants, and so, so what was written is, is done. It's from a past age not to be applied or used today. Now, I agree there is discontinuity between old and new covenants. The question is, what is discontinuous and what is continuous and, and we know one thing that is continuous is our God and his nature his morality his ethic his righteousness he is eternal and he is unchanging and so his standards of holiness and his ethical instructions are unchanging and so taking the ethic and the principles and the morality of all of Scripture, including the Old Testament, is not out of bounds for us today because it reveals the nature of our God. And so the morality of Scripture is, is not discontinuous, as if God is somehow much different today than he was back then. Okay, so there's some, some misunderstandings that I, I want to try to clarify. And let me also uh, seek to clarify or maybe, maybe push back on, on other ideas and assumptions that we have. And, and again, we're going to get the, to the word here in just a moment, but I did lay, lay some groundwork of some of the conversation that's been happening. There's also some assumptions that underlie the hesitation and the objections to saying that God's law ought to apply to all areas of life, including our society. And some of those underlying assumptions as I see them one of them is this that the Old Testament law is actually harsh I, I have a sense and, and, I, and, I, and I, I think I'm right because um, I, I'm pretty sure I was there just a number of years ago that the Old Testament law was really unduly harsh that it wasn't quite just just 
that, that the, 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 especially the sanctions and the punishments just, just seemed too harsh as, as we look at that with our modern eyes. And I think there's, there's a general sense among many Christians that the Old Testament law, that, that, if, that if we were to live in ancient Israel, it actually wouldn't be a good society to live in. You actually wouldn't want to live there because it's too harsh. You, you wouldn't want to live in that kind of strict society. I'm not sure why we're squeaking. For instance, the prime example in the Old Testament is about that rebellious child that is brought before the elders of the city and they're stoned. And you have modern Christians who, who believe the word of God through and through who read that and say, well, that's harsh. I'm glad I don't live in that time. And so we have to ask, is God harsh? Are his laws in the Old Testament harsh? Was he too hard on sin then? Or are we too soft on sin now? What's the problem? Is it a problem with God or is it a problem with us? Another assumption I think underlies our apprehension to God's law is that we have a notion that God's law serves one purpose, to lead us to Christ. That the law of God serves as the schoolmaster to lead us, that tutor to lead us to Christ. That is the purpose of the law. That if we preach and proclaim the law, it is only so that people would see the need for Christ, that their, that their sins would be exposed, and that they would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the use of the law. It, it doesn't go beyond that. And so I think even in modern day preaching, you, you, have, you have some preachers who are shy or timid to take the commands of Scripture and say, you must do this. But rather the temptation is always, well, I know you can't really do it, so this, this law only serves to expose our weakness and our need for Christ. And so I've heard preachers preach, for example, from Ephesians 5, which says, husbands, lay, love your wives as Christ loved the church and lay down your lives for them. And the preachers say, well, Men, we know that we can't actually do that. And so this just exposes our need for a savior. And so thank God for Christ. Now there's, there's truth in that. Because the law does lead us to Christ. But that's not the only purpose of the law of God. But that's in our mind today or it's popular today. And we'll get into more uses of the law in, in a moment. Another assumption that I believe is there is that the, the law of the Old Testament is no longer binding in any sense. For instance, we eat selfish today. We wear mixed fabrics. Some have tattoos. And so the, the laws of the Old Testament we know are not binding. But the, but the question still becomes, well, are, are all of them not binding? Can we go anywhere in the Old Testament for, for any laws or precepts? Is there a reason why some of those dietary laws are, are no longer in effect? And so I think we just got to be more careful. Another assumption is that the Old Testament law was for Israel alone. That the law of God given to Israel was for Israel alone. It was not binding upon the Babylonians or the Canaanites or the Philistines or any other nation. And so why would we take that law and seek to apply it to our nation today? It didn't apply to those nations. And so the law of God was for Israel alone. Now... It, it must be conceded and, and agreed by all that certainly laws like circumcision, the Sabbath, those dietary laws, the sacrificial system, that, that, that was given to Israel uniquely. But then we also have to ask, well, why did God then remove the Canaanites from their land? Why did God judge the Babylonians or the Persians or the Greeks or any, anybody, any other nation in Scripture? Why did God judge Pharaoh in Egypt? What law or what standard were, were they judged by if it was not for God's law? And Romans 3 tells us quite plainly that every single person is under the law. 
and that's under God's law. Okay, so those are some of the, I think, that are sometimes unsaid assumptions that, that make us hesitant uh, or at least cautious about this idea. And caution is okay. We just want to think through it uh, carefully. Now let me dive into a few passages of Scripture. Okay, so that was, that was all just kind of laying the groundwork and trying to get some, some assumptions, some objections out of the way. And so now I want to, I want to turn your attention to Scripture. And, and I want to, why don't you take your Bible and turn to Psalm 119 first. Psalm 119. The first thing I want you to see in Scripture, when Scripture talks about the law, is that the law is good. The law is good. Now, I know when I say that, if I just say that, like, without any qualification, the law is good. You know, someone can clip that and say, wow, Pastor Tim's a legalist. Pastor Tim's a Pharisee. You know, there's no gospel there. That's, he, he thinks the law is good. Um, but the Bible says the law is good. And, and there's no footnote after every one of those sayings saying, well, in only certain senses. No, the law is good. good. It is reflection of God's righteousness and his character. The law is good. Now in Psalm 119, look at verse number 16. It says, I will delight in your statutes, I will not forget your word. Okay? I will delight in your statutes. The law is not only good, I love it. Look at verse number 20. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Oh God, I love your rules. I want them. Look at verse 24. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Look at verse number 31. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. Look at verse number 35. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in them. Now, you could spend the next 30 minutes going through the psalm, reading all of those, and you'll see that repeated theme. The psalmist loves the law. Loves God's precepts, his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances. He loves them. He delights in them. He wants them. As Christians, can we say this? Can we sing this? Is the law of God our delight? Do we want to enjoy them? Do we want to know them? Do we want them to govern our lives? We can sing Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is not a, not a chapter of Scripture for the Pharisee. This is for the, the one who loves and fears God. They delight in his law. And we can also maintain the law was never meant to save. God saves. Christ saves. But the law is good. And so we have a dichotomy today between law and gospel that sometimes can be very unhealthy. By saying, well, the gospel is good, law is bad. Promises and assurance of salvation in Christ, good. Precepts and statutes and principles and commandments, bad. And when you go here, make sure you don't stay here long. You got to get back over here to the promises because the law is not very good. It's just kind of the bad news that sets up the good news. But that dichotomy is actually not in Scripture. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says that as he goes around with the gospel, he says it is the aroma of death to those who are perishing. The gospel is bad for those who are perishing. The stench of death. It's the warning of God's judgment. And then Psalm 19, verse 7 says the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The King James says converting the soul, giving life to the soul. And those are two verses that seem to flip the modern dichotomy on its head. And so the gospel is good. The promises of God are good. And the law of God is good. And so we can't 
um, fall prey to sometimes those modern imbalances. Next, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Let me read verse 17 down through verse 19. This is Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what is Jesus teaching here? Now, some would interpret this passage by saying, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill them. And through his fulfillment, they are now of no effect. So in other words, he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the the law, which actually abolished the law. So he did come to abolish the law. What Jesus is saying here is that he didn't abolish the law, but he, he fulfilled the law. And then he continues to reiterate what he means by that, by saying that every iota, jot, tittle, every smallest stroke of the law will be upheld until all is accomplished. He is the one who will accomplish the law, bring it to its completion. And he says, and anyone who relaxes the least of these commandments will be least in the kingdom. What commandments is he talking about? He's talking about the law and the prophets. If we relax that and say, well, well, that is no longer binding, that is no longer in effect, that is no longer true, he goes, you will not have a good place in the kingdom. And remember what Jesus is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching the law. And he's teaching the, the true nature of the law, about lust, about adultery, about hatred and anger about retaliation, and about loving your enemies. Jesus is giving us here an exposition of the law, and by no means is he teaching that he came to abolish it. Rather, he's teaching it. He's upholding it. He's come to fulfill it, to bring it to its proper completion and proper end. And so we have this passage in Scripture that tells us about the abiding nature of the precepts, the commandments, and the statutes of God's law. And you remember when a detractor came to Jesus and asked him what was the greatest of the commandments? How how do you summarize the commandments? And Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. He goes, this is the fulfilling of the law. This is the sum of the law. Jesus came to do that. That's what he meant. He came to fulfill the law. He came to love God with all of his being, love his father, and to love his neighbor as himself. And Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The law is somehow not here, like abstract and unloving. The law is love. The law is the very definition of what it means to love. How do you love your neighbor without knowing the law of God because the law of God tells you how you ought to love your neighbor? And so this dichotomy that we have today is is unhelpful. A few other passages I want you to turn to. Um, Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. This great book articulating in detail justification by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the sovereignty of God. It's an excellent articulation of so many important doctrines. 
including the law. Romans 3 verse 31. As Paul just talked about how the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And we say amen and amen. He says in verse 31, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. And that is a, an emphatic negative. King James says, God forbid. No way, Paul is saying. We uphold the law. Justification by faith doesn't do away with the law. But we uphold the law. The law was never a savior. But rather, as we're justified by faith, we uphold the law. It is not overthrown. Also, look in Romans 7, verse 12. Romans 7, verse 12. Paul says, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. And what law is he talking about? Well, he's there just talking about covetousness. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the Old Testament law given to Israel. And he's writing here to a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles and saying the law is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Look at verse um, verse number 22 in Romans 7. He says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Now he mentions here the struggle that he does not do the things that he wants to do. But it bears witness that the law is good. And he delights in the law, just like the psalmist does. Paul, the, the one who articulated that we are justified by faith apart from work, says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Because he knows the law is not a savior. It's Christ is a savior. But the law is good. Now, I want to get into the uses of the law in just a moment. But let me read a few quotes. Uh, this first here is by Thomas Watson, Puritan. And if you haven't read any Puritan's works, uh, Thomas Watson might be a good one to dive into. He's, he's very readable and used tons of word pictures to describe. And you'll see it here in, in this quote. He writes this. The scripture, as Chrysostom says, is a garden and the moral law is the chief flower in it. It is a banquet. And the moral law is the chief dish in it. The moral law is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, Psalm 19.7. It is an exact model and platform of religion. It is the standard of truth, the judge of controversies, the pole star to direct us to heaven. Though the moral law be not a Christ to justify us, it is a rule to instruct us. The moral law is unalterable. It remains still in force. He also writes this. But though the moral law be thus far abolished, it remains a perpetual rule to believers. He's talking there about the ordinances given to Israel. Though it be not their savior, it is their guide. Though it be not their fotis, a covenant of life, yet it is norma, a rule of life. Every Christian is bound to conform to it and to write as exactly as he can after this copy. Do we then make void the law through faith, God forbid, Romans 3.31. Though a Christian is not under the condemning power of the law, yet he is under its commanding power. This I urge against the antinomians, those who are against the law, who say the moral law is abrogated to believers which as it contradicts scripture, so it is a key to open the door to all licentiousness. They who will not have the law to rule them never shall never have the gospel to save them. Also, one more quote from Matthew Henry. Um, his father was Puritan minister, nonconformist minister, and, and he wrote the famous commentary, Matthew Henry commentary. It's probably on every Christian's bookshelf uh, or on your phone or somewhere. Uh, very, very popular. And I want to read what he says about Matthew 5. He says, The rule which Christ came to establish exactly agreed with the scriptures of the Old Testament, here called the Law and the Prophets. The prophets were commentators upon the law. And both together made up that rule of faith and practice which Christ found upon the throne in the Jewish church. And here he keeps it on the throne. He protests against the thought of canceling and weakening the Old Testament. The savior of our souls is the destroyer of nothing but the works of the devil, of nothing that comes from God, much less of those excellent dictates which we have from Moses and the prophets. 
No, he came to fulfill them. He asserts the perpetuity of it. That not only he designed not the abrogation of it, but that it never should be abrogated. The word of the Lord endures forever, both that of the law and that of the gospel. Observe the care of God concerning his law extends itself even to those things that seem to be of least account in it, the iotas and the tittles. For whatever belongs to God and bears his stamp, be it ever so little, shall be preserved. The Jews reckoned the least of the commandments of the law to be that of the bird's nest in Deuteronomy 22, 6 and 7. Yet even that had a significance and an intention very great and considerable. It is a dangerous thing in doctrine or practice to disannul the least of God's commandments, to break them. That is, to go about either to, con- to contract the extent or weaken the obligation of them, whoever does so will find it is at his peril. And that's from Matthew Henry. So when we go to believers of old, they upheld the law of God as being the, the rule of faith. And, and the reformers um, articulated what they called the, the three uses of the law. And I just want to say that so this is something that Christians have, have believed for, for a long time. I think we need a, I need a reminder of it. And so some of these uses you're familiar with. The first use, probably the one you're most familiar with, is that the law is a mirror that, that, ref, that we look into and that we see ourselves and we see our sin and our need for a Savior and so drives us to Christ. That's, that's a use of the law to drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you have probably listened to Ray Comfort and, and how he goes about evangelism and how does he do that? Well, he goes through the Ten Commandments. He reminds people of the law of God and their need for a Savior and then he leads them to Christ. That's a use of the law, a proper use of the law. But it's not the only use of the law. We saw there in those quotes from Thomas Watson that the law is also used to guide the regenerate into good works that God has planned for them. That we are being conformed into the image and likeness of Christ as Christians, and the law is that standard. And so for the believer, the law is our, is our good and is our delight, and we seek to conform our lives to it. And we know we're not saved by it, but it is our, our goal and, and, the, and, the, and a means of sanctification in our lives so that we be conformed into the likeness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if you want, um, just for the sake of time, I'm j- jumping over some of these scripture references here, but if you want scripture references, I have a, a pile for each of these uses of the law, but they're very common to look up. The last use of the law that I want to mention that I think is often neglected and, and bears weight on this conversation about the use of the law in our society or in our culture in general is that the reformers talked about how the law also had a use to restrain evil. That the law cannot change the heart, but the law does inhibit or curb lawlessness by threats of judgment. A few passages I wish to read. First is in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy 13. And I'm going to read verse 6 through 11. Deuteronomy 13, verse 6 through 11. And this is the use of the law talking about how it's a restraining force against evil. It says in Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 6, If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend, who is as your own soul entices you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, Some of the gods of the peoples who are around you, whether near you or far off from you, from the one end of the earth to the other, you shall not yield to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him, but you shall kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. You shall stone him to death with stones, because... He sought to draw you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. 
So we know in Scripture that false prophets would get stoned. In fact, that's the first part of Deuteronomy chapter 13 that I didn't read. And then here, if anyone is seeking to take you away into false gods, into idolatry of the nations around you, or any other false religion, it's the death penalty. It's that serious. It is disloyalty. It is treasonous towards God who delivered you from the land of Egypt. And when that punishment is carried out on that individual, then the fear of God will come upon everybody. And so when that law is implemented, it is imposed, it is laid down with its full force and its penalty, it will cause everyone to be afraid. To restrain them in their evil. And so there we see a use of the law. Now you're thinking, well, such a use is not in the New Testament. But we know, of course, it is. In Romans chapter 13, a passage that I know many of you are very familiar with. Romans chapter 13 says nearly an identical thing. It doesn't list the particular sin. But in Romans chapter 13, Chapter 13, it argues that we ought to be submissive to governing authorities because they've been appointed by God and those who resist will incur judgment. And listen to what it says in Romans 13, verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad conduct. They put the fear of God in evildoers. Why? Because the law is laid down. It says in verse 4, he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And so when God's wrath is carried out by the civil magistrate, it puts fear in others who will be tempted to commit those same evil acts by knowing this will not go unpunished. And so it restrains sin. And we, we, just, we know that intuitively in our society. When, when crimes aren't punished, it gives license the people to go ahead and do that. If there are severe sanctions and penalties, well, it gives people a second thought. And so the law of God is a restrainer of evil, both in Old and New Testaments. Look also in 1 Timothy chapter 1, a passage we looked at last week, but I want to go back there again. 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 8. It says there, now we know that the law is good. Exactly what we've been saying. The law is good, Paul says. If one uses it lawfully. And what lawful understanding does he have of the law here? He says in verse 9, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I am entrusted. It is a false statement to say the law of God is only for Christians and only to lead us to Christ. No. The law of God is good if one uses it lawfully. And one of those lawful uses of the law is that it is laid down. That is, it is enforced. Its sanctions are there. Its punishments are there. It is laid down for the ungodly, for the wicked. And as Paul goes through this list here, he's, he's going through, you can see in his mind, he's going through the Ten Commandments. That's what he's unpacking. That that ought to be laid down against the ungodly to restrain sin. And it's in accordance with the gospel, not contrary to the gospel, in accordance with the gospel. And so what we see here is that the law's use, the law's good, first off, and it's used as a mirror, see our sin, lead us to Christ. It is used as the Christian's delight and guide to sanctify us, and it's also used to restrain evil in a wicked society or in any society. And we see that here taught plainly in both Testaments. Okay. Um, I'm over time. Let me end with this. I was going to mention about natural law. Um, 
Some argue that natural law forms a better basis for our society than, than God's word, but, but God's word is, is supreme over natural law in the sense that it is clear, divine, special revelation. We have it in black and white. There's no misunderstanding. But this, this point I want you to take away from this. The law is good. There are many uses of the law, including the restrain evil. And also, we must recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. In Revelation 1.5, it says that he is the ruler of the kings of earth. That the kings of this earth owe their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. By what standard ought they to rule? They ought to rule according to Christ's standards and according to Christ's laws. He is the ultimate standard. And we also have to realize that this is an issue that touches on the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency of Scripture. We live in a day and age where to, to deny the inerrancy or the truthfulness of Scripture is like a, a major no-no. Even people who don't really believe the Bible will say, I believe the Bible and it's all true. Because they know if they don't say that, that there'll be such reaction from Christians in every quarter that they won't be able to continue to pretend that they're a Christian. But what we do today is say, well, yes, the Bible is true. It doesn't have error. Front, front to back, it's good. But we, but we deny its sufficiency. And we see that in churches today where the whole manner of church is designed after be, being seeker sensitive. And, and it's, it's very pragmatic. Uh, and it's, you, don't, you don't look to the word of God to see how we ought to be structured and ordered or what we ought to do. You rather look to the world and, and what, what would be most effective in seeing those people come in here. It's, it's, it's not a denial of the truthfulness of Scripture, it's a denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. Saying the Bible is actually not sufficient for how we ought to operate as a church. We see this happening in, in homes today. People who reject, you know, roles of men and women and, and the, the proper nature of the home. It's not that necessarily saying the Bible is not true. They're saying, well, it's not sufficient to speak into that area. That, that I have another authority somewhere else that is influencing that. And I believe also when we talk about our society that for many Christians we neglect the sufficiency of Scripture as it applies to our world today. That Scripture is sufficient to speak to all areas of life, including the laws of the land, including how society ought to be structured and run. The Scripture is sufficient. It doesn't necessarily speak about everything, but it speaks to everything, including what we see in the world around us today. Okay, so remember the sufficiency of Scripture. It is sufficient for every matter of life. Remember the lordship of Christ over all things, including the kings of this earth. Remember the uses of the law, and remember also that the law is good. Okay, so that's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, labels, not that helpful, but those ideas, hopefully we can all say yes and amen.